So, what I want to do in the lecture today is demonstrate the different steps that we talked about about process technology and the vehicle I want to use for you know demonstrating the different process uh, steps is is the microprocessor. So last time we discussed whether microprocessor is is going to be the linchpin of semiconductor industry or not. So probably our answer was probably not because we saw in the bit of materials that you know other chips, uh, the 4G LTE chips, the communication chips were costing much more. And similarly, if you see in your devices today, most of the bottlenecks you feel are not because of you know the processor being slow, especially in a tablet or if, if your client is just manipulating parallelograms, you don't need a very high you don't need a very high end microprocessor, but still it is uh, where a lot of the leading edge steps in process technology uh, take place. And so this is the cross section TM of uh, the A6 microprocessor which came out a few weeks ago and the Intel 22 nanometer IV bridge. So the, the first thing, even just looking at it, the cross section looked pretty different, right? So uh, IV bridge, you can see they have more granularity in your interconnects. So you have multiple levels of interconnects versus in an A6 microprocessor, you only have a few pitches of your interconnect. So M1 to M4 are all the same pitch. M4 to M6 are all the same pitch. And then the levels above are also of similar pitch. So the reason is if you want to change your pitch at every lithography step, you have to optimize that lithography step. You have to create a new mask. You have to do all your optical proximity correction again. So if, if you're not that worried about performance, you probably are OK with that kind of uh, interconnect where you have only three levels of pitches in your interconnect levels. So this is, you know, just by looking at the chips, they look uh, different too. And if, if you take out all the level of interconnects and take a photograph when you have removed all of the levels of interconnect, it looks something like this. So this is a six transistor uh, SRAM cell. If you take a cross section view, it would look something like this. This is a uh, even though it says IV bridge, but this is a 32 nanometer transistor. And uh, <clears throat> so you ask, you know, how, how is this a six transistor SRAM cell? So it's uh, what I've done here and in a few of the videos as well is to actually list out uh, all the transistors of an SRAM uh, cell. So uh, SRAM cell is actually two of these uh, inverters cross connected to each other. So the gate of this is connected to the source and drain of the other one. The gate of the first one is connected to the source and drain of the other one. So it's essentially two cross connected interconnect, which is also a flip flop. So it will either be in a state zero or you, if you flop it, it would be in a state one. And you have two other transistors, which are NMOS, which are uh, essentially used to read or write the uh, state into the cell. So the way this is laid out is you have um, these parallel lines which are your gate lines and these perpendicular lines which are your active lines. And you always have two, at least two N or at least two P lines together because we'll see why that is the case. But you have at least adjacent uh, active regions. So these two probably are P type and this is N type. And this one is N type too. I don't know how, is it showing clearly? I can't see. It's much more clearer on my screen, but <laughs> uh, so this this is one of the gate lines. So these, this is running connecting two of these transistors in the inverter. So you have a N MOS here, a P MOS here, and this gate is connecting to the source and drain of the other inverter. Similarly, the gate of this inverter is connecting to the source and drain of this inverter. And then you have these two extra transistors, which are your pass gate transistors. So this is the most uh, efficient way to lay out a six transistor circuit. So this is why it's, it's, it's designed this way, it looks this way. Uh, in your problem sets, you have um, one of the layouts which shows you eight transistor DRAM and you need to identify all the transistors over there. Yeah. Is there a way to identify uh, whether it's an NMOS or PMOS? 
just by looking at so a cool tip which uh, is that typically uh, electron mobilities are twice that of hole mobilities right so uh, active line for an n mass is always wider is always thinner as compared to an active line for a p mass because both of them need to have the same amount of current right so if the mobility of this one these two are lower they need to be wider to support the same amount of current so you will always find p lines to be wider and n lines to be thinner so that that's one way you can identify which one is p and which one is n it's a good question so the first thing we need to start our process is uh, we need some wafers right so the most common wafers uh, which are used are p type wafers <coughs> And they could either be bulk or you get these things uh, which are called SOI wafers, where you have a thin layer of silicon. It, it is separated from this handle wafer by this oxide layer. It's also called, uh, if this thin layer of silicon is less than 10 nanometers, so it's also called ETSOI or uh, extremely thin SOI. The company which uh, makes a lot of this SOI wafers is a company called Sci Tech. They have a special process to make these uh, wafers. So the, the first step we do when we start is, is essentially we need to isolate our regions where we make P-type transistors from the region where we make N-type transistors. So the first process step that is often done is isolation. We need to isolate the areas where we are going to be making PMOS from the area we are going to make NMOS. And the reason why it's uh, necessary is uh, if you don't do that, you essentially have a region where you're making all your, uh, so these are your NMOS transistors, which are N source and drain and P well. And this is your uh, PMOS transistor, which is P source and drain and N well. So if, if you don't isolate with them, these are essentially uh, below your transistor. So this is your CMOS circuitry, but if you look below, you actually have a BJT because you have this N, P, N region here, and you have this P, N, P region over here. And these are cross-connected. These are, again, the emitter here is connected to the base here, and the base here is connected to the emitter here. So these are cross-coupled BJTs. And if you don't isolate these P, N, N regions, you will get a latch-up phenomena happening here. If, if I mean, some of you are E, so you might be, a large majority of you are E. If you're not an E, just, uh, just keep in mind what you need to do is isolate this P region from this N region to avoid uh, the latch up. So <clears throat> the first step that you typically start uh, uh, your shallow trench isolation is you put a oxide and a nitride layer and uh, this is a very common uh, material layer combination use where uh, the nitride layer, uh, it's called a pad nitride, and it's a very common hard mass material. And uh, by hard mask, uh, what I mean, it's, it's harder as compared to a photorealist. Specifically, it's harder to etch as compared to photorealist. So if you're going to be etching things, if you're going to make patterns and etching features into your silicon, uh, you typically use a hard mask, which essentially is a material which does not etch, and it helps you form your feature. So nitride is a very common uh, hard mask. Sometimes people use an oxide layer, not sometimes, almost all the times. People use an oxide layer below it because it uh, helps in sticking. It also helps to reduce the stress. Uh, Another hard mass material we'll see later is uh, tinitrite, which is again a very difficult material to etch. So people use that as a hard mass. As well. <coughs> then what you do is uh, once you have done your hard mask, you spin a uh, photorealist. So you uh, spin this layer of photorealist. So I'm describing this process for once. We'll be repeating this again and again. So I want to make sure you understand the process of patterning and etching things the first time. And uh, so you spin a photoresist, uh, and these photoresists are these light, sen light sensitive organic materials which either form bonds or break bonds depending upon if you expose them with a high energy light. And uh, if you have worked in a fab, you might have seen uh, 
these equipment where you spray for resist and spin the wafer. And the layer, the thickness of the fur resist just primarily depends upon how, how fast you spin this, uh, spin your wafer. So the next step which is done is, 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 is lithography. That is, you expose this to light and you make uh, these uh, patterns. Uh, many times when you do in, in SNF, you don't uh, use uh, this thing called anti-reflection coating, but most of the time if you do it in an industrial lab, Below your photoresist, you lose. You use an anti-reflective coating because you have. When you shine light, you'll have reflection, right, reflecting back from the surface too, and you want to avoid avoid forming standing waves in your resist. So you use an active anti-reflective uh, anti-reflective uh, coating, and just like it happens in a university fab, after each critical process flow, there's an inspection step. So after your resist. Uh, De uh, resist uh, develop, you inspect if it. If it's not okay, you rework your resist. Right. So if your resist is okay, you again go to the next step, which is to uh, form this isolation. So essentially, this is a, a plasma edge step or a dry edge step, or also known as a reactive uh, iron edge. And these are typically uh, gases which are used are halide gases or uh, like bromine, uh, fluorine, uh, CF4, these are the common uh, etchant, which are gases which are used for etching. And the reason they are used is they, when they react with uh, your uh, material you are etching, that is silicon in this case, they formed in this case it will form uh, CIBR4 or CI, uh, sorry, SIBR4. And that's a volatile compound, so it immediately goes away. And for things like silicon, ox or silicon oxide, or aluminum, uh, we actually we are fortunate that we know gases or we know chemistries that can dry edge them. As uh, we we'll see later, most of the new materials which are being developed, like we'll discuss later, like copper, people want to put all kind of materials in the periodic table. Uh, into your uh, microprocessor, but there are very few materials which the edge chemistries are known for. So, so that's why people prefer to use a damascene kind of process rather than an edge process because essentially the edge chemistries are not known. And I'll, I'll come to a damascene process in a few slides. But again, after each step in this box is shown the inspection step that is done. So in this case, you, when you etched it, you check whether you have the required profile, so you do a profilometry, so you track a tip, and you check your profile in wider trenches. You also this thing is called OCD, or uh, optical inspection of your depth profile. That's also a step uh, very commonly used. And so once you have formed this feature, you fill it up. So you fill it up with an oxide. If it's a large area feature, you can use any process you want. So you can use a high density plasma. Or So as dimensions are shrinking and things, these aspect ratios of trenches that you need to fill are getting higher and higher. So you need films which can, or you need very high density of plasma, or you need films like, uh, which use a different chemistry which can fill up this high aspect ratio. Or sometimes you use films which are flowable, so you fill them and they flow in, and they flow in and uh, fill your feature. A good thing is that when you make smaller features, your capillary f force actually goes higher. So capillary force is inversely proportional to the distance between, or it's inverse, it's uh, inversely proportional to your, uh, I think it's the third power of your uh, feature size. So if you have a smaller feature, your capillary forces in fact increases, so it tends to pull things inside. So that's one of the forces which is leveraged to fill uh, smaller features. <coughs> so the next step you do is essentially you have filled this feature, you polish it, and the uh, the process which is used is a CMP or a chemical mechanical uh, planarization. This is one of the processes which <laughs> causes a lot of your defects are caused from this process because even if you have one defect and this the way CMP works is like a grinder. So if you, even if you have one particle, it will grind 
all over your wafer. And uh, so again, what is needed is an inspection step after you uh, do this uh, process. <coughs> and then you come and remove your uh, hard mask. And in this case, hard mask was nitride. So you can use a chemistry like a phosphoric acid chemistry, which can remove your remove your nitride. And it's very selective to nitride. So again, after this, you need to make sure that it's flat. So there's another inspection step. And then uh, in this case, it's a bright field inspection step since we are uh, checking for uh, uniformity. So the, process, the point I want to emphasize or uh, the take home message here is that you need with every process step, you need an inspection tool. So uh, the fastest and the most common inspection tools are based on uh, optical techniques. So if you have worked in the fab, you, I'm sure you know you. Every time you do a process, you go and check it inside. You know, and look look into a microscope and look for you know particles or whether if you're patterning, did you form the resist or not. And there are two kinds of microscopes. There's a dark field microscope and a bright field microscope. Uh, the, the difference is shown uh, very clearly here. So in a bright field, you essentially look in the field of view of your reflected light. So if it's a bright field microscope, your, your uh, detecting eye or your lens would be placed over here. If it's a dark field microscope, you look at, at a, from a larger angle where you are not in the field of view of the light, of the reflected light. So <clears throat> if you're looking for particles, so this is a question. So if you're looking for particles, like very small particles, the, the, if you're looking for particles, you want to look for scattering of light. So if you're looking for scattering of light, a better place to look is in the dark field. So if you're looking for particles, it's preferred to look in the dark field microscope. If you're looking for like features like steps, right, it's better to look in the bright field microscope. They show up better. So interference patterns show up better there. Scattered patterns show up better in a, in a, in a dark field microscope. So these are the same, I mean, they're more sophisticated versions of this which are used uh, in the industry, but the operating principle is the same. You're looking at uh, scattering or uh, uh, interference from uh, your defects or your particles on your, on your wafer. This works fine as long as your particles are bigger than the wavelength of light, but what happens if, if they're smaller than the wavelength of light? Or they're much, much smaller than the wavelength of light. So then, then what do we do? Most of the other uh, inspection tools, they are based on this uh, electron beams interacting with your wafer. And you might have uh, used many of them uh, while working here, so the this is, you know, the parade of how, how deep uh, you can inspect using different, uh, different of these particles. So the most common of these is your secondary electrons, and, but they don't give you too much information of depth. Another uh, uh, common tool is this, uh, which utilizes backscatter electrons, and they also contain the material information. So besides just telling you the defects, they also tell you the material from your def of which your defect is made or the material of, your, uh, of the film you're inspecting. And then deeper below are your X-ray particles. But uh, this is, uh, the point I want to emphasize is with each process step, you have uh, inspection steps. And uh, increasingly, as processes are becoming more and more complex, the number of uh, process steps you have for inspection, they just keep on going up and up. 